2. Salvation versus Insurance James Hastings' Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, Volume 12, devotes 60 pages to worship in various religions. The series of essays on worship are learned and informative, but in a real sense futile, in that there is no common definition of worship possible. The writer struggled as a result to find in a variety of religions something which is largely alien to them, and that the word worship has for us a biblical context, whereas what is called worship in these other religions has often little relationship to anything we would recognize as such. Christian worship is an organized corporate act grounded in personal as well as corporate faith. It involves more than ritual, important as ritual is, it is instructional and educational in that the scriptures are read and expounded. It involves corporate singing and praise to God and the glorification of God's sovereign power and purpose. In all these things, Christian worship is radically different from pagan, quote-unquote, worship. There is a reason for this difference, and this difference is rooted in a key fact that makes pagan temple practices no more than secondarily or incidentally worship at their best. Christian worship celebrates salvation and victory. If it fails to do this, it is not worship. In pagan temples, there is no celebration of either personal or corporate salvation. Instead, there is a transaction which is, in essence, the purchase of insurance. Blackman wrote of ancient Egyptian temple rites that, quote, The whole object of official worship, as represented in the temple reliefs, was to obtain the favour of the divinities for Pharaoh. In return for the offerings which he presents to them, they promise him victory, gladness, life, stability, health, good fortune, abundance, millions of years, the duration of ray, an eternity of jubilees, etc. The very temples of the gods were erected by the king that he might receive in return the, quote, duration of heaven, end quote, quote, hundreds of thousands of years, end quote, and that he might, quote, be granted eternity as king, end quote. Thus the designation of every ritual act, quote, giving, very doing, this or that, to or for his father, variation mother, NN, end quote, is followed by the words, quote, in order that he may make an endowed with life like Ray forever, end quote, the, quote, endowed with life, end quote, being, of course, the king himself, end quote. We have already seen how an Egyptian lover threatens the god of his love charm field to work. The reason for such attitudes in paganism was that the function of the temple was essentially to provide insurance and the insuring agent was a god or spirit. Because the god or spirit had supernatural powers, he was feared and it was good business to stay in the good favour of such a force. Before embarking on a voyage, undertaking a task or on facing a personal or family crisis, the pagan sought to buy protection by going to the temple or altar and offering a sacrifice. The gods functioned somewhat like an old-fashioned Italian mafia, usually honouring loyalties but essentially self-centred and ruthless. Their favour had to be bought at a price. However, if the god or spirit failed, then obviously he was either unwilling or unable to provide protection. In either case, he was either an enemy or a cheat, and reprisals could be taken against the god. Very obviously, this pagan belief has infiltrated the church. The spare tire concept of God, as Otto Piper pointed out some years ago, is very prevalent. A spare tire is not normally used. In fact, it is highly desirable if it is never necessary to use it. However, common sense requires that a man carry a spare tire and always avoid being without one. For many people, God is a spare tire, not normally to be used and an annoyance if required, but a good thing to have handy in case of trouble. Such an attitude confuses faith in God with a belief in the value of fire insurance. Countless numbers of church members, for example, believe that a great tribulation lies ahead, 
Many others, conservatives and liberals, have been persuaded by the press and by current events that grim days lie ahead. Such books as Lindsay's horror story capitalise on this fact. The result is that many people become ostensible believers who are in reality buying an assurance policy against disaster or tribulation, an insurance which promises to rapture them out of any such dire event. One popular preacher assures his listeners that, because of the supposedly imminent rapture, they may never die. But salvation is not insurance against problems, troubles or tribulation. The apostles and the saints of the early church were certainly not spared fearful persecutions and executions. The Reformation era saw many burned and beheaded for their faith. The 19th century saw many natives in Africa and Asia slain for their stand for Christ. In the 20th century, the Turks, as well as the Marxists, have slain millions of Christians. Salvation did not mean an insurance policy for them. Nothing is more dishonest than the common quote-unquote witness at testimonial meetings which says, quote, The Lord saved me and took away all my troubles. Salvation increases our responsibilities because it makes us responsible men and it thereby increases our troubles. Salvation does not remove us from troubles, tribulation or problems. Rather, it thrusts us into them and at the same time, gives us the assurance of victory in Jesus Christ. We may lose a battle now and then, but we shall win the war. Moreover, every lost battle also adds up to victory, for, quote, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. The religious quest for insurance is pagan. Where the desire for an insurance governs a church or a theology, we have paganism revived. Salvation in Scripture is neither a promise of escape nor an insurance guaranteeing immunity against tribulation. It is rather the assurance of victory in the warfare of life. A clear indictment of the desire to withdraw appears in the account of the transfiguration of Christ. Matthew 17, 1-8 Mark 9, 2-8, Luke 9, 28-36. Moses and Elijah appear as representatives of the law and the prophets, conversing with Jesus on his decease or exodus at Jerusalem, Luke 9, 31. Peter, James and John were thus made witnesses to the fact that the whole purpose of God's revelation and redemption was to be fulfilled or put into force in Christ's atoning death and resurrection. This decease or exodus, the word used in the Greek text, was the departure or exodus from the slavery of Egypt, of sin, into the redemption and new creation of God. The cross represented both the death sentence on the fallen world and the release of its captives to Christ, the destroyer of sin and death. The new creation is the goal of the law and the prophets, and they were forerunners and evidences of that new creation. Mark tells us that the disciples were exceedingly, or, quote, sore afraid, Mark 9, 6. The vista opened up by the declaration of the true exodus, the crucifixion and resurrection, was a shocking and frightening one. They wanted the kingdom of God to come in by Christ's proclamation and miraculous power. The prospect and view for Christ, and then for the disciples thereafter, was a terrifying one. They had been dreaming of positions of power in the kingdom. Matthew 18, 1-5, Mark 9, 33-37, Luke 9, 46-49. Now it was apparent that something else was in store for them first, a worldwide battle against the powers of darkness in the name of Christ. Their preference thus was not to go forward into that battle-born history, but to stand still in terms of the supernatural experience of the moment. Peter, quote, said unto Jesus, Lord, It is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Matthew 17, 4 Their hope was to continue at least for a time to dwell on the revelation of the moment. For them, revelation was to be used to arrest history, not to further it. 
God then answered them out of the overshadowing cloud, a symbol of glory and judgment, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew 17.5 Calvin said of this declaration, quote, When he enjoins us to hear him, he appoints him to be the supreme and only teacher of his church. It was his design to distinguish Christ from all the rest, as we truly and strictly infer from those words, that by nature he was God's only Son. In like manner we learn that he alone is beloved by the Father, and that he alone is appointed to be our teacher, that in him all authority may dwell. End quote. Hear him. I mentioned a little ago that these words were intended to draw the attention of the church to Christ as the only teacher, that on his mouth alone it may depend. In short, Christ is as truly heard at the present day in the law and in the prophets as in the gospel. So that in him dwells the authority of a master, which he claims for himself alone, saying, One is your master, even Christ, Matthew 23, 8. But his authority is not fully acknowledged unless all the tongues of men are silent. If we would submit to his doctrine, all that has been invented by men must be thrown down and destroyed. The intention of Peter in calling for three tabernacles was a pious one in part. It was the desire to commemorate a great revelation event by an act of honour and piety. Piety is thus a very common substitute for true religion and an impediment to salvation. The piety of Peter... James and John was designed to forestall Christ's death and resurrection and the subsequent responsibility of the apostles to confront a hostile world with the gospel. Thus piety was to replace conflict, but in so doing it would have denied salvation. This attitude has been all too common in the church. To forestall the conflicts over faith and doctrine which might tear the church apart and cleanse it, The pious ones plead for a pious withdrawal instead, as though salvation means withdrawal rather than victory. Such piety, moreover, makes a great show of spirituality and reverence, and it presents itself as superior to the, quote, troublemakers, end quote, who want a godly confrontation. True piety, or growth and sanctification, is a work of God's grace, whereby those whom God has chosen before the foundation of the world are, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, renewed in their whole man after the image of God, so that now, in obedience to the law word of God, they put his word into force in every area of life, serving God in joy and in thanksgiving. It is the application of Christ's victory, of his saving power to every area of life in terms of his word. Thus, where the pagan wants insurance against trouble and problems, the redeemed man wants victory over all troubles and problems. The victory of the Christian begins with Christ's redemptive power in his own life, and he then applies that victory to every sphere of life. One school of pietists speaks much of, quote, victorious living, end quote. By this, unfortunately, they mean a neoplatonic flight from the responsibilities of life. In modern Protestantism, it was John Wesley who propagated the idea of, quote, entire, instantaneous sanctification, end quote. More recently, champions of the, quote, the victorious life, end quote, have been Charles Godelet Thumble, longtime editor of the Sunday School Times, Hannah Whittall Smith, author of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life, James H. McConkie and his The Threefold Secret of the Holy Spirit, W.E. Boardman, A.T. Pearson, A.B. Simpson and others. Their opinions are marked by the spiritual pretension of a higher way, quote, the second blessing, end quote, and so on. These pietists preach faith and pious human effort as the solution to sin. That is, instead of recognising God's grace as a remedy for sin, they see faith, as man's effort, as a remedy for sin. People are thus urged to have more faith, pray more, indulge in more acts of pious withdrawal from the world, and so on and on, 
and thus by their efforts acquire faith, power against sin. It is, as Warfield pointed out, a Pelagianism which substitutes man's faith for Pelagius' works. It formally affirms God's saving power and justification while insisting on, quote, Christ, plus my receiving, end quote, as the, quote, hope for victory, end quote, against sin. W. H. Griffith Thomas, in his interpretation of Romans 7, gives us the fallacies of, quote, victorious life, end quote, theology. That chapter depicts for us the process of the eradication of the old nature, Dr. Thomas reads it statically and sees it in merely a, quote, deadly warfare between the two natures, end quote, which he affirms, quote, does not represent the normal Christian life of sanctification, end quote. He even permits himself to say, quote, there is no divine grace in that chapter, only man's nature struggling to be good and holy by the law, end quote. What is really in the chapter is divine grace warring against and not merely counteracting, but eradicating the natural evil or sin. To Paul, the presence of the conflict there depicted is a guarantee of victory. The three things we must insist on if we would share Paul's views are, first, that to grace always belongs the initiative. It is grace that works the change. Secondly, that to grace always belongs the victory. Grace is infinite power. And thirdly, that the working of grace is by process and therefore reveals itself at any given point of observation as conflict. Insofar as Dr. Thomas's representation obscures any one of these things, it falls away from the teachings of the New Testament. End quote. Wherever man separates himself from God and the grace of God, there he also tries to rival God and to be more than man. Not surprisingly, not only do the, quote, victorious life, end quote, people seek to be holier than God in his word requires, but also to equal God. Thus, in Everyday Religion, 1893, Hannah Whittle Smith, quote, makes Mark 11:22 mean, quote, we are commanded to have the same sort of faith that God has, Romans 4:17 describes, she says, the sort of faith God has. He creates things by merely calling them as though they were. How much of this creative power of faith we his children share, I am not prepared to say, she modestly adds. But, she continues, that we are called to share far more of it than we have ever yet laid hold of, I feel very sure. All this from a simple objective genitive. One would like to see them try their system of interpretation on Colossians 2.12, end quote. In the name of God, such pietists have advanced a blatant humanism in which God is not the sovereign Lord and Saviour, but simply another greater resource available to man. Thus, Dr. A.T. Pearson, in his book on the Keswick Movement, quote, speaks of God as a reservoir of grace on which we draw and even permits to himself such an objectionable phrase as, quote, the Holy Ghost power, which we are informed is at our disposal, end quote. The implications of such blasphemy are plainly stated by Warfield, quote, God stands always helplessly by until man calls him into action by opening a channel into which his energies may flow. It sounds dreadfully like turning on the steam or the electricity, This representation is employed not only with reference to the great matters of salvation and sanctification in which God's operations are quote-unquote secured or released by our faith, but also with reference to every blessing bestowed by him. We are not only constantly exhorted to quote-unquote claim blessings, but the enjoyment of these blessings is with wearying iteration suspended on our own quote claiming end quote them it is expressly declared that God cannot bless us in any way until we open the way for his action by an act of our own will. Everywhere and always the initiative belongs to man. Everywhere and always God's action is suspended upon man's will. We wish to make no concealment of the distress with which this mode of representation afflicts us. When Erasmus even distantly approached it and spoke of, quote, securing, end quote, the grace of God by, quote, some little thing, end quote, retained to human powers, 
Luther told him flatly that he was out Pelagianizing Pelagius. Man does not quote-unquote secure the grace of God. The grace of God quote-unquote secures the activities of man in every sphere and in every detail of these activities. It is nothing less than degrading to God to suppose him thus subject to the control of man and unable to move except as man permits him to do so or to produce any effects except as he is turned into the channels of their working at man's option. End quote. The pagan view of spirits and gods was that they were a resource man could use to provide insurance against troubles. With this utilitarian view of the gods, there still went some reverential fear of them. In the modern pietistic, victorious life and other Pelagian movements, such as Campus Crusade and the Jesus movement, even this reverential fear is often lacking, and God is merely the great resource which man can tap if he will. In such a perspective, man is sovereign, and God the resource and insurance agency serving and glorifying man so that the whole world is turned upside down and God made man servant and instrument. Man has become his own God and saviour, and God's function is to act as the insurance agency so that man may prosper. There can only be divine salvation where there is a sovereign and omnipotent God. The salvation of the sovereign and triune God is of necessity victorious because it is wholly determined by himself. As Nebuchadnezzar finally recognised with respect to God, quote, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Daniel 4.35 Only such a God can be truly worshipped, and only such a God can truly save man. <laughs> 